Okay, let's talk about our patient today. Our patient today is a dentist. Young lady, a preeminent lecturer. The dental hygienist from Bulgaria. Buffalo, New York. Atlanta, Oklahoma, Vancouver, Canada, Boston, Kansas City, San Francisco, Montreal, Munich, Germany, London, and Santa Maria, California. Now we're going to place 14 lumineers, 8 lumineers, 10 lumineers, 6 lumineers, 10, 2, 8, 8, 10, 10, 8, 10, 8 lumineers today on our patient. And now we're not treating teeth anymore. We're treating smiles. Isn't that beautiful? So let's look at the transformation from where we started and where we are. Our patient today is an example of that. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the placement of lumineers on our patient today. Uh, what we're going to do today on this patient, uh, let's see, what did we do for you? Uh, we checked your teeth out, and I wanted to uh, look at your bridge because I wasn't a little concerned it's leaking, and Dr. Lett looked at that. And uh, we've made six lumineers for this patient. Uh, she's going to have eight, but uh, we only made six. So you'll see six in place today. So you'll see... Uh, when we get finished, why, I think you'll see why, eight are better than six, because it tends to be a little more prominent when you just do six. It seems like if you do eight, or you do four, or if you do two laterals, uh, those work out better. Uh, but anyhow, I've been doing these for over 20 years. And somebody said, well, what makes uh, your serenade porcelain laminates different, and why are they new? And uh, we started pressing them uh, about uh, a year and a half ago and we call those lumineers. Lumineers are pressed serenade porcelain almost always unless you request stacked porcelain. Uh, we hear the terms like feldspathic. All porcelain that we use in the anterior segment of the mouth is feldspathic. The difference is it's either stacked or it's pressed. If it's pressed, it has more strength. If it's serenade and it's stacked, it usually has as much strength as other porcelains that are pressed. So when you hear terms like feldspathic and it's pressed, press is just the way you handle feldspathic porcelain. So it, this enables me with the material to have contact lens thin veneers. Anybody can make thin porcelain. All of a sudden for 20 years your lab tech told you that you have to cut away more tooth structure. That's the first thing you heard when you got out of dental school, wasn't it? Sent a case to the technician. He said, if you want me to make this look good, you've got to cut away more tooth structure. And so we dutifully went back and cut away more tooth structure. Our goal here is to develop materials that require no or little or only that tooth structure to be removed where you, in your judgment, you'll get a better aesthetic result. So when you're working with a lumineer system, you don't have to even remove a half millimeter tooth structure. You can. Uh, frequently on most patients, I'll remove some enamel, but it's cosmetic contouring. Uh, I guess the guide that I have is what I remove makes them look better, so even if we never went forward, they would look better. You take away what you believe is in the best interest of the patient's cosmetic, not because you're going to take it away so you can build something up. Uh, the other thing that you want to think about is we're going to place uh, six luminaries, I believe, on Beverly today. And uh, she's had her teeth, that they're not really bad teeth, but you wouldn't have them ground down, I don't think, if you had to have them ground down to make them look better, would Absolutely you? Not. Yeah. And so these are the people we're getting to. Every dentist has a lumineer patient in his practice that hasn't been treated. If you haven't placed a lumineer case, there's a patient in your practice you haven't treated. And uh, you can use these on adolescents, you can use these on older people. And the thing that's nice about it is that all whole process begins and ends without giving the patient a shot for anesthetic. So we've done a lot of these, and you're going to see it's not complicated. It's like flying an airplane. You want to be prepared. You have a checklist to go through. And so the, what we have in place uh, is my dental assistant. She is my co-pilot or pilot or navigator or whatever, but 
she's the one that's got it all set up. And I just walk in, sit in the pilot's seat, and I firewall it, and I sit back, and the plane flies. That's you got pilots in the audience, you know that's what it's all about. Where you have a problem is if you forgot to check your gas cap or put your wheels down or do some other minor things like flip a switch here or there. So being prepared is critical. And the way we get prepared is we have the staff review DVDs of the technique. That's very important. Two or three times, not on the same day, not sequentially, but on different days, so that when they get finished, they can tell you, the dentist, what you're supposed to be doing. That's when you know your staff is trained. The next thing you want to have is you want to have your tray set up and have everything convenient so when you and the patient sit down, you don't have to waste a lot of time. So uh, I'd like to show you the setup that we have in place with Lisa. Lisa has been with me for 20, 30 some odd years, I think. She was only six, I guess it was, when you came to work for me, was that? Huh? And uh, at any rate, Lisa has prepared all this. So let's take a look at what Lisa's done. And uh, she has those pieces of porcelain. Did you hear what I called them? Pieces of porcelain. Because these pieces of porcelain are a matrix. And we're going to use that matrix to carry the restorative to our patient's teeth. You get to take a look at those pretty soon. So what you really want to think about is restoring the tooth and achieving what? A stress-resistant, non-microleaking, aesthetic restoration. That's what we're about. Something else that's important is you got to have something that assists you. With this magnification, four power. Four power is the key. If you don't have four power, you're being underserved. And you'll watch when I put these in, there's very little bleeding, if any, and uh, there won't be any sensitivity. And the reason I can do that is because I can see so well. I can distinguish between sensitive tooth structure visually rather than by tactile sense. So four power magnification. The next thing you're going to see that's going to make this relatively easy is the pack light. It'll take me less than one minute to place uh, eight luminaires. Today we're going to place six, and uh, we'll expose each uh, luminaire for about five seconds. So six times five is 30 seconds, and it takes me two, three seconds to go from tooth to tooth. Uh, that's important because when you're placing these, you don't want to make a mistake. You don't want things floating around. You want to get in, get out. And so like when the pilot goes out to the runway, he's got everything ready to go. He firewalls it and sits there, and then the plane flies. That's what happens when I'm on the runway when I'm using my uh, pack light. Uh, it's very important to have a good impression material, the one we like to recommend, and it's a luminaire impression material because it's a two-bodied uh, system and you get really nice margins with it. And one of the things we'd like to tell you about before you send your cases in is pour a model and be sure that you're satisfied with the integrity of the margins. That is, uh, that is a very important thing. So uh, if you have to retake the uh, impression, uh, the patient will still be in your office and you don't have to call them back in. Because every so often we see some where they had drag or something like that, and another uh, point I'd like to make is don't take the impression out too soon. Wait an extra minute. And the reason for that is many times the luminaires will fit the model, but they won't fit the teeth. And when they won't fit the teeth and they fit the model, it's probably because the impression material was taken out just a tad too soon. So it's better to have an extra minute in there and be extra certain. One of the things Lisa has done already is she's put two solutions on the porcelain veneers or the pieces of porcelain, the lumineers, and she's put on porcelain conditioner, which is an organic acid, and then she's put the serenade prime on. And she's done that because that porcelain conditioner activates the serenade prime. It's very simple. So uh, when you put that in, that makes your silene the most active it will be. Because silenes, once they're activated, begin to copolymerize with themselves. You get fewer reaction sites. And so a uh, silene that has been pre-activated loses its bond strength uh, in relation to the time it's been activated. So that's why we have it set up that way. You get the freshest, most active, most excited silene possible in the Serenade Prime. The other thing that uh, Lisa has done is she has polished Beverly's teeth. She 
She's polished Beverly's teeth with uh, the porcelain polishing paste. And we like to use that instead of pumice. The reason we like to use that instead of pumice is it gets rid of the biofilm on the teeth and you get a better etch. Uh, we're not going to do anything on Beverly's bicuspids today because this one may have to be uh, replaced because there might be a little caries on it. But I want you to, you know, sometimes they say, well, you get retraction of tissue. Well, you always get retraction of tissue on pores diffused into metal crowns as well. And uh, so most of the cases that we see have little or no recession after 5, 10, 15 years. Uh, not any more than you would expect if the tooth didn't have anything placed on it. White now. Now what I'm doing is placing a little paint on dental dam before we get started here on the lingual side of the teeth. Now we're going to cure that paint on dental dam at about an inch away. Close your eyes. The best way to protect your eyes is to close them. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now let's take a look at what we just did. See that blue on the interproximal and the gingival embrasures? Okay, now wherever that blue is, the ultrabond won't be able to go into that area. So when we get finished placing the lumineers, uh, we can tell where the blue is that that isn't ultrabond. It's much easier to take out. I just want to do one thing here. I need to check and see, explore, and make sure it has polymerized. And, okay. It's soft. I don't want it to be rock hard. Okay. Now remember, we've put two solutions on the porcelain. And we put two solutions on the teeth before we do a try-in. And we're only going to try in two or three teeth. I'm using etch and seal a medium viscosity, and the reason I like etch and seal is because it contains aluminum oxalate. I like the medium viscosity because then I can push it around with my brush and I have total control. And it just goes where I put it. The reason I like aluminum oxalate is because I can use this on dentin and it seals dentinal tubules. One of the advantages of lumineers is you have patients that may have sensitive teeth. Well, the last thing they want is to have their teeth ground down. You'll never get sensitivity with lumineers because if you're doing lumineers right, you take away that tooth structure, which is not uncomfortable. And when the patient feels something uncomfortable, you stop. You say, well, what if it isn't just perfect? And I say, well, what we do is we wax it up and see how good it will look. And it's amazing they ended up looking perfect. Sometimes you can't get perfect unless you do orthognathic surgery. Now we've checked your old composites and uh, while well, they're discolored, they're not leaking. And if I put these on and we discover a year from now that we discover a year from now that they need to be replaced, we just replace them on the lingual. Now on top of that, at surface, we're going to put 10-year AB. And I want to put several layers on. I want to show you something here. We're going to do a try-in. So, which tooth is this? I always have my assistant call out the name of the tooth, not the number, the name. And you can see we're going to be lengthening these teeth. 
There was a uh, old composite on there. This is the right central. Now, if you take a look carefully here, you'll see that even though they're the same shade, they're not quite the same. See that? Why is the left one whiter? Well, there's a phenomena in the optical transmission of light that when it goes from one medium to another, if it doesn't exceed what they call the critical angle, that's from my optometric background, you didn't get that in Biology 101, but uh, if it doesn't exceed the critical line angle, then it, the light transmission continues on. So by putting the ultrabond tri-in paste on this right central, we're picking up a little bit of what's underneath from the natural tooth, and it's continuous. On the left side, we're not picking up anything because the critical angle was exceeded when it reached air, the air between the etched surface and the tooth. So that looks whiter. That's why you get that frosty white look. And so we're going to remove that surface, and you can see a little difference here on the patient's left central is a little whiter. Now we'll let the patient make a choice. Would you like the left side or the right side better? You like the left. Okay, they usually do. Okay. But now she had, to, she had the opportunity to make a choice. That fulfilled the need of the you and the patient to give some approval to it and be participative. Now I'm taking tenure S, and so I had to take those off and give her what she wanted. And what she got was too white. Now I'm applying here as tenure S to remove the Ultrabond try-in paste. Now what makes Ultrabond try-in paste nice is that it's not aqueous. It's the same formula as Ultrabond. And I'm blowing the excess off. Now tenure S will also cause the try-in paste to polymerize if you don't do anything else. So Lisa's taking out the excess try-in paste from the veneer with tenure S. But don't put the tenure S on before you do the try-in, otherwise you may not get the tooth off. And if, it's okay if you got the right shade, but if you got the wrong shade, okay. So the advantage you have with Ultrabond Plus is that you've got about 10 minutes of working time. You don't put the light on it. And if you put the light on it, you get instant polymerization. Left central. Right lateral. Okay. So you see, this really isn't too complicated if you think about it. Cuspid, right? Okay. Left cuspid? Right cuspid. Always repeat what uh, they give you and what you think they said. And now what I'm going to do before I get over to the left side is I'm going to take the two millimeter tip on the sapphire light. And I'm going to spot cure the center of these teeth so when I shift to the other side, they won't dislodge. I know of more dentists that have had a problem where they've been trying to finish before the resin was set. And we're going to take the, uh, you even get this one here, give it one second on the two millimeter tip. Close your eyes. And close your eyes. I fix it and then I close my eyes. And I fix it. I close my eyes. Now we'll go to the left side. <laughs> Notice that on this left central, I didn't give it the one second spot because I don't want to even take a chance on having this resin. See this resin is so soft on the interproximal? This ensures that I'm going to get a perfect fit as I put these together. Now the contacts will all be perfect contacts. And I don't use uh, paste in there. I don't use strips because if you add up the thickness of six strips or eight strips, 
gets to be quite a bit there, and then you don't get the veneer seating. I usually, when I'm doing uppers and lowers, I usually like to do the uppers, and then after we've got the maxillary in, then I like to take and start solving the problems with the lowers. You can do them together, and many dentists do, and they're very good at it, and they're very successful at it, but as I've gotten older and I have less time, I'm not in a hurry so much. Now, people ask me, when are you going to retire, Ips? And I say, now, what can be easier than what I'm doing here? A little brush, a little resin, a little luminaire on the teeth. Does it get any easier than this? And everybody's handing it to me, see? <laughs> and then I know what you're thinking. Man, I've been cutting those teeth down. I've been making those temporaries. You should have Jessica. You know, it's Lisa that worked for the uh, dentist where they used to do traditional. And the patient would get out of the chair and close your eyes. And they'd be tired, and just glad to get out of there. Close your eyes. And close your eyes. Okay. So, now I can halfway relax. We're off the runway, but I don't have the wheels up yet. And you see, we can take some of this out in between. And let's take a look at what we have on the lingual side. Yeah, we got quite a bit in there, so we'll start taking that out. What was that question? What? Uh, no, I never do, because when I floss between there, I've just lodged some of these, and I get... Have you ever had a, gotten a negative pressure when you're taking an impression, and you get a void? Have you ever done that? Well, that's what can happen when you fool around with that floss before your resin is set. Okay, now we're going to go do the real polymerization. We've got it spot, well, spot cured in place. Close your eyes. Five seconds per tooth. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. We don't like to have more than a five second exposure because it gets a little hot. Close your eyes. Well, now we can sort of relax because we have bonded these. Okay. Can you see those all right? Let's see what it looks like on the lingual side with the mirror. Looks just like it did before. Now I'm going to start taking the paint on dental dam out. Can you see that all right in the mirror? The parts of pieces coming out. And yeah, that got a little bit set up there. I'm going to check and make sure that these margins are all taken care of. And we're done. You can send the patient home now. Well, tell them if they brush and that, the ultra bond will flake off and you can have them back. Now it's just finishing. I don't know how long that takes us. We about 10 minutes. What we're going to do now is start removing the ultra bond, and everything I'm using is in what they call the finishing kit. Okay, it's got the diamonds, the Sure 349, the Seri saw, the Sandy uh, Sender. You can create feather edge margins with this. You don't have a shoulder. And so we're going to get rid of that because I'm wearing four power magnification. And that's the key to the whole thing, four power or more. If you're only using two and a half power, you're only seeing things like you did when you were 25. So now we're going to start out with the Sure 349. Sure 349 is an orthodontic band seating instrument. And it won't scratch the glaze. Looks like your hygienist scaling instrument, and you could have your hygienist do this for you. You could probably even have a, an extended uh, certified dental assistant do this for you. And I'm just taking off most of the labial ultrabond. Let me pop a little bit of this out. We just do whatever's easy. Let me go on the lingual side. 
And you want to make sure that you've got set ultrabond between the porcelain and the tooth because now you have one solid fused mass. And you're just going to go back to Dental Anatomy 101, start carving. Okay, I'm going to start with the 12 fluted burr. I was going to use the uh, ultrafine football shaped diamond. I'm going to go around the interproximal embrasures. Now the secret to opening these contacts is to get rid of as much ultrabond as I can between these embrasures. But as you notice, when I start opening the embrasure, now the teeth begin to look better. Think about it. If uh, you put these in and these embrasures are not opened, the teeth don't look like they're going to look after we get finished, so you'll remember that. And the reason I'm using a 12 fluted burr is because it won't cut the porcelain, but it will remove the ultrabond. And so the porcelain serves as a guide for my burr, that and my four power vision. Okay. Now I'll go on the lingual side and open those embrasures a little bit. So these things start to come to life a little bit. Doesn't that look a little bit better than it did with the ultrabond all over? That only took like five or six minutes to get to this stage. Okay, now I want the uh, football shaped diamond. Okay. Now I'm using the ultra fine long narrow diamond and I'm going to go through the margins here and get rid of the shoulder. Remember, since we didn't create a shoulder in the tooth with the burr, we now have a shoulder in the porcelain. I used to have the patient sit in the chair for an hour and a half, two hours. And while that isn't long by our standards, it gets to be a long time for a patient sitting there with their mouth open. And I try to have the patients finished in an hour to an hour and a half, and I get about 80% of the finishing done. And then the patients are so happy with the transformation that's taking place. You know, I tell them there'll be a little ultrabond flick off and things like that during the week, and what I missed we'll get on the next time. And then the next visit is really a very pleasant visit because we don't even have to do any bonding. We sit and talk. And I like to let the patients tell me how much their friends like their appearance of their smile. Did you notice I didn't say teeth, I said smile. Up till now, we've been treating teeth. Now we're treating smiles. And what I'm doing with this moisture now, the ultrabond that was stuck to that dry porcelain with my wet glove is wiping most of it off. Now with this needle nose diamond, you can see that I can get into the embrasure even more without the danger of ditching the porcelain. That's something you want to be very careful about doing. These needle nose are really good for the interproximal embrasures. Okay. Pretty soon you get to look, but not yet. <laughs> Gently close on your back teeth. Look how nice those incisal edges and everything look. I can't think of anything that I think is more fun than taking a couple of hours and transforming somebody's life so dramatically and with so little effort on my part. Now notice where the occlusal marks are. It's on our natural teeth. So this is a pretty protected one. 
if you don't protect your veneers and you've got a patient with a really strong bite on it, you can break those pretty easy. We're going to start out with a seri saw. Remember now, all these contacts are fused. There's very little ultrabond between the teeth. If you try to open the contacts with a lot of ultrabond in between, this is a lot of work. So you take it, you're going to have to get it out sooner or later. So get it out before you open the contact. Now we take a seri saw. And this was developed by Dr. Harvey Putter. And we start going through the contact. And you start sawing. And if you run into a little resistance, stop sawing and start rocking. See how I'm rocking here? Because when I was sawing, if you break through like that, sometimes it pops through down into the interdental papilla. Now we're going to take the seri sander. Well, I guess we've just about done everything here, so the other thing I would do on her next visit is I would take the 30 fluted finishing burr and polish up all the rough edges. I think I'll wash a little bit of this off now. Now you get to look. Okay. Roll of the drums. Come on, guys. Yay. <laughs> we got to start. I'm, gonna get, I'm getting some ideas. Did you hear that? Wow. Now, what, what can you do? Nobody's ever felt that about my golf score. Nobody's felt that about my big fish or anything, you know. But when I do this, boom, bah. Huh? Unbelievable. Isn't that incredible? Huh? It is incredible. Yeah. We're covering wow. your mouth, huh? no. But be careful now, you better cut off a half millimeter tooth structure every time you see a patient. Because if you don't, terrible things might happen. Patients might come back, patients might look forward to going to the dentist. You know, I, I, you've, you've all read these guys, be careful, huh? Right? Be careful not to do it the old fashioned way, is what I'd say. But if there's a good reason to take it off, then do it. Case selection is really important. Look at that. Oh, hey, that's good. Let's do that again. A couple of bounces back and forth. Your biggest, your biggest problem isn't going to be doing this. Your biggest problem is going to have you and your staff communicating to patients about this procedure. I mean, here you are, a dentist. You've seen it happen, and you still can't believe it. But people believe that going to a dentist, if you're going to get something done, it's going to be uncomfortable. That is your challenge. You've got to tell them there's the modern way. That's why we say it's the biggest development in 4,600 years. Because forever in the practice of dentistry, we have been doing destructive things to people and then putting something back. That's your challenge. The other challenge you have is your mind. Every one of you right now in your practice have at least one patient you could help if you prescribe lumineers. Like maybe you have a granddaughter. Maybe you have a daughter. Maybe you have somebody the teeth aren't bad enough for braces. Maybe there's something you like to do and you could just put them on. I did that for my granddaughter for her 16th birthday. For her 16th birthday, she got porcelain veneers, but they were lumineers, not the regular kind. And I, you couldn't do it otherwise. So there's, if nothing else, you've got a few patients that, that could really benefit from this and they're not being treated. Because you know, there's people you don't want to remove a half millimeter or three quarters of a millimeter tooth structure. And with this, you can do it. And you heard her expression. I mean, that she wasn't acting. She's normally kind of a subdued lady. <laughs> um, before I got my lumineers, I was very self-conscious uh, about my, my teeth. And I didn't like looking at pictures of myself. And I thought as I got older, I would overcome my, my lack of confidence and my self-consciousness. But even recent photographs show me covering my teeth with my bottom lip, lip when I'm smiling or uh, smiling without showing my teeth whatsoever. I, if I had to have my teeth ground down, I don't think I would have gotten these lumineers. Um, I think I would have just been content to, to look the way I always looked before. It feels great to let all that go. It's, um, you know, again, it's kind of like... Um, I know it sounds corny, but I really feel kind of free and that uh, that self-consciousness was kind of a burden I was carrying around and that's been lifted and, and it's gone now. 
Well, with my new smile, I certainly feel more confident. Um, I laugh a lot more. I've had friends and family comment that uh, they like to see me, you know, throw my head back and laugh loud. Um, and I still find myself, even after a, a period of time, looking at my teeth and still being surprised at how great they look. And it makes me just feel really great about myself. I think what I'd like to tell people who are considering getting lumineers is that uh, the process was relatively short. Um, I had six lumineers uh, put on, and it took less than 50 minutes. And they were comfortable. I adjusted to them very quickly. And I would recommend them to anybody.